and I chose this one. Um, I've got the dimensions up here. So there for uh, about seven days. The class was six days, and the guy that taught it, Toll, he's uh, probably one of the master, one of uh, many master blacksmiths that have taught at the school. Everyone in the class, I felt like I was near the bottom of the class, but there, most people weren't that familiar with it. So it took me about 65 hours to make it in the six days. We would go in set at 8 in the morning after breakfast, and then we would go to lunch, go to dinner, come back, and then leave the forge about 10.30. And we did that for five days straight. The sixth day was a little less. So about 65 hours worth of time. But the first two days was making the tools to make this. There of them up here. These are the uh, chisels, the drifts, the punches. This is an outline of the piece, the size. And mostly when, we were, when I was working on it, once you get some of it together, it's all uh, mortise and tenon pieces. And all the pass-throughs are drifted, punched and drifted. The hardest part I had was the circle. This is free-floating. And the trick to that is to cut this piece in half and then forge weld it back together. And this piece, to get it together, is forge welded here. To do that, you have to put the whole thing in coal. So it's manipulating this whole thing once you get it hot enough, particularly in one place, that you don't burn up another piece. But anyway, so that was... Um, that was the, the choice that I did. If you guys have any questions about the school, I'll be glad to answer them for you. I can't say enough good about it. I know Jesse was getting ready to take a class what, la or this spring, and Hammer in came along. And I think Joe was looking at a class down there as well. So, but anyway, it's excellent people. The instructors are fantastic. I have all of the drifts. Yes, Caitlin is taught there as well. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's some huge instructors down there. It's, uh, but uh, Toll was one of them. Actually, the guy over in Waynesboro that runs the uh, Virginia Blacksmithing Institute, Dale Morris, he's instructed there. Uh, Randy McDaniel from over in West Virginia is instructed there. Just a couple that just come to the top of my head. But Alan Crest, does, right? No, no, go ahead. But anyway, so um, any questions right now about this piece before I get into the nails? Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, uh, and then I had to come home and make an easel to set it on. And so it's kind of a masterpiece, but I haven't been around long enough to really make a masterpiece. But help yourself. It's, uh, thank you. Help yourself. Come up, pick it up, play with it. And these are the tools I made for it. And, of course, they're tenons. Tenons. Also. We also had to make a tenon, which was this one, and we designed it. 
And of course, it uses traditional joinery. Everything we did there was traditional joinery. Uh, although I did use a power hammer on a couple of the uh, the drifts and the punches, or on the punches, not the drifts. We had a couple of those, and I think those were the only two I used the power hammer on. Sorry. No, not traditional hammering, traditional joinery. But um, so then I was thinking about what to do for this class. So I really can't make one of those. And um, I was trying to think of some of the original joinery. Of course, uh, mortise and tenon has been around thousands of years, just from woodworking, but probably even before uh, maybe the Iron Age. But then I thought about one of the basic pieces of joinery, traditional joinery, that people still use today is nails. And I'd never made a nail before. And so actually I took a class over at Dell's place and it was nails and hinges and traditional kinds of uh, putting things together. So when I was, took the class and I was looking at his hitters, hitter is a thing that um, used to make nail hits and I saw his and his was just made out of two pieces of metal welded together one was a, looked about like that one with a large hole drilled in the end then another piece looked like that one that was welded to it with a smaller hole drilled in the end and then with a fitted to make it square so I decided to get when I got home I was going to make one so I could teach myself how to make nails so I started with that, and then I welded the two pieces together and punched through. So that's how I, so that was how I got started with it. And I'll put both of those pieces in the iron today. So I ended up making two pieces for myself. One I made two punch too big, so that one works for three eighths inch stock. And this is the one that I've used most of the time for quarter inch stock. Bruce was nice enough to bring these two pieces in. Of course, Bruce being the tool maker, this one he made, and that's made from a rail, train rail bolt. Bruce, do you want to, where'd he go? Did he leave? No. Anyway, so he took a bolt. And I think he cut part of it off and then designed this. And I'll pass this one around too so you can see. When you make a nail, oh, I don't even have it up there. When you make the, uh, if I can hold this up. Oh, can you see that? All right, so when you're making the nail hitter, this being the base, the handle, and this being the top, when you punch it, you punch it from the bottom so that the hole is kind of triangular shape. That way you can get your nail out of it easier when you finish. And this is one John Elliott sells on blacksmithing.com, blacksmithingsupply.com. And that's the nail hitter that he sells on there. But again, both of these belong to Bruce. I'll pass these around. <clears throat> so when I started <coughs> started learning blacksmithing, which has only been a couple years, I didn't even start blacksmithing until after I retired. And um, so when I first started, I uh, started making, like, that was one of my basic first class here. And I always heard that you had to make a hundred hooks before you could make a good one. Well, I got to a hundred, I still didn't make very good hooks, but they hooked. You could hang them up, you could hang something on them, so that worked. So I figured I'd have to do the same thing with nails. Well, after my first 235 nails, I still can't make a nail. But anyway, some of these would work. They would probably hold two pieces of something together. So a couple months ago when I decided, I said, okay, I'm going to make six nails every day for the next two or three months, and there you go. So um, I'm going to get into making a couple of nails, pretty easy to do. Uh, the hammer that I brought with me, I just 
pass on a nice thought was my grandfather's. He was a black man, as was his father and his grandfather. But that's the only piece I had from my grandfather, and I use it every day. But anyway, so if somebody wants to fire up the forge, we'll get on it. I'll pass that around too. So what I'm passing around there are the pieces, like the piece that I made that's going around here, showing how to do it. And if anybody wants a copy of that, I'll be, I've got them on my phone. I can email them to you as a PDF. All right. So anyway, there's about six steps to making a nail. I've got this over here. Uh. And Bruce was kind enough, he brought in a couple of sample pieces that he made that are showing. Uh, Joe, can you zoom in on that? Is that possible? Or can you see it? Okay. So the first part, and I'll go through it as I'm doing it, but um, far end, lifting it up to put a point, just like you would a hook that you're going to plug in or anything else you got pointed. The second is to make a soft shoulder, which is about there, and that's what you're going to use the um, use as your age when you can fit that down to the shoulder in your hitter, then you're ready to make the head. And with the head, we're going to use oh, the hot butter. Cut it off and then twist it off. And then put it in the hitter and put a hit on it. One thing that's very easy to do when you make the hits, and I still keep making them sometimes, is I'll either not get it hot enough or I don't hammer it right, but you end up with a hit that looks like that. And that's called a corner nail because you can put it in a corner. Not necessarily a compliment making a corner nail. All right. It's true. The head, yeah. And while I was doing this, I figured I'd have some downtime while I'm doing this. So I did a little research on nails. Apparently, they think the first nail was made in Mesopotamia about 3500 BC. Okay, now take a break from that. So basically I'm going to do a half hammer blow on a lifted piece of steel on the far side of the anvil. It just got cold. So anyway. So a good blacksmith could probably make one of these on one heat. I can't do that. But anyway, so Mesopotamia, first nail. Archaeologists have found them in Egypt that date back to 3400 BC. So nail's been around a while. All right, so I'm just putting a point on. Now I'm going to bring it back to the near side. Leave about an inch of stock thereabouts and put a soft shoulder on two different sides. And that'll be my mark I'm going to taper the metal down to. Okay, well, let's bring up some more history. Uh, iron and nails 
in spiritual text in the Bible there are 25 mentions of nails and 91 mentions of iron uh, the Quran has five and all the Wiccan witchcraft all that's among that group. All right. Oh. oh, I found something really cute about even. Though it's not about horseshoes, but we do use nails for them. So apparently the Irish are the ones that came up with putting the horseshoe above your door to keep out evil. One of the things I found where that's from is apparently the devil went to a blacksmith shop and wanted shoes for his hooves because devils have, black, have hooves. And the blacksmith guy, the farrier, decided he was going to make his shoes extra hot. So he fitted him with extra hot shoes. The devil's feet or hooves caught on fire and he ran out the building. So that's why if you put on your door, the devil won't come. Yeah, or so that's the story. So then with that story, that leads into which way do you put the on the na on the ho of above the door? Do you put it with the open side up or do you put it with the open side down? Okay. All right. Well, that's what I thought too. And it's still, that's still true that it holds your luck in. Now, I also found that according to some of this in the they would turn it the other way so that when a blacksmith walked through his door into his shop, the essence of the iron and luck would fall on his shoulders so that when he went to work, he would have that extra hump. So anyway, now so I went in my shop and turned it around the other way because I can use all the help I can get. I think we're small enough yet, but we'll give it a check. Nope, we are almost there, almost to the shoulder that I put in. All right, what else we got? I'll save that one for a minute. Uh, I started with square rod. No, just because I'm making them square, it saves me a little bit of time squaring it. I, I can use quarter inch round, and I, I did some of the nails in there were made out of quarter inch, quarter inch round. So you can use it either way. You just square the round on your first heat. Oh, that would make sense. Makes a better head. That would make sense. Yeah, there are a lot of ways. Every blacksmith, I think, has its own way of making a nail.
Okay, so now I'm up to the shoulder. I don't know if you can see it. That put it out. So now I'm going to heat it up and then we'll about half of the way through the hot hardy. Uh, okay, deader than a doornail. Does anybody know what that means? <laughs> okay, for those that don't, then there are probably a couple meanings to it. Um, so back in medieval and before when they used to put the big timber doors together, if you ever look at one, you see all kind of 20 nails in rows going across. Well, once you get the nail through both pieces of timber, the door and the, the cross member, you bend the head of the nail down, and that's called a dead nail. That's where that term came from. Huh? Because you can't take it out? Why? Right. All right, so when I'm doing this, before I lose, that's all right. All right, so I'm going to come back about two lengths. So I'm coming back just about a half inch. And I'll start my cut. And then I go to flip it 90 degrees. Flip it back 180. So hopefully I'm getting them all in about a line. And then I'll go to the 360. So what I'm trying to do, let me heat that back up again. What I'm trying to do is to get a cut when I break it apart that's in the middle. I still have um, a lot of tendency to make corner nails, so maybe I should try the using round stock instead of square stock and see if it doesn't work better. But, uh, let's break this. And if you do use a cold forge, a coal forge instead of a gas forge, before you stick it in to heat it up to get your last heat, otherwise you'll burn your tip up. So you lay it in the coal like that, even a little bit more, and leave your tip sticking up out of it because the tip will catch, will burn up. So we'll heat that up, and then I'm going to twist, put it in the hitter, put it in. I'm going to twist it, and then immediately I'm going to go to the You could use the Pritchell hole, just for whatever reason, use the Hardy hole, and then start tapping it down. And some people do the little design, hitting the four sides, which I haven't really mastered that one yet. So this is kind of a lousy nail, but we'll send it around. I'm going to get over here. Yeah, it's all right. We'll try one more. And then I've got a special treat. For you. All right, so first step. And far into the end, we'll put a point on it. Then come back about an inch or so, put a soft shoulder on two sides. If you hit that shoulder too, it kind of messed up my head, so a little soft. Uh. And if you can't tell, this is my first demonstration with the club, so.
All right, get that hot. All right, another good story. Uh, I found a Turkish saying. It's a hammer with flowers is still a hammer for the nail. So no matter how pretty your hammer is, you can still nail a nail with it. All right, my last story. All right, so in Scotland, near the town of Perth, if you're familiar with uh, Roman Britain military history, they were problem bringing the Scots to do what they wanted to do. The Scots were pretty mean mothers up there. But anyway, so in 83 AD, they built a big fortress up near Port Perth. It only lasted a couple of years because they couldn't get the Scots to listen. So they burnt the fort down and they took all of the nails and it was about one million nails and they buried them in a hole. They didn't want the Scots to get the nails and make weapons out of them. Anyway, in 1960, a guy was walking and this big piece of rust was sticking out of the ground. And it turned out it was a million nails. And fortunately, the, all of the nails on the outside had corroded so bad it sealed all of the ones in the middle in. So after 2000 or 1800 years, all of the nails in the middle still look like they did originally. And that's a true story. You can actually, I don't know if the ones they're selling on eBay are the real ones, but they are in museums all over the world. But the, um, you can get them on eBay for about 20 bucks a piece. About half, or just about, I'm sorry, about 20, uh, shit, sorry, lost the chain of thought. About two times the thickness of the stock, whoever asked that, yep. Yeah. I've read anywhere from one and a half to two, depends on how thin you're going to make the head, or how big you're going to make the head. If you were making a big spike, obviously, I guess you'd want it a little bigger than that. And this one I cut off too much. So this will be one of those, don't do it this way. This will be the last time I use this. Yeah. Normally when I was practicing, I'd just have a container of water. Yep, that's kind of an ugly one, but it'll still work. And pass it around. Now, for that treat I was telling you about, we do have a gentleman here, Kurt, who used to do historical illustrations. Was it in Williamsburg? Uh, no, it's actually over in Chicago. All right, come on up. I'm going to get him to show you the right way to do it. Well, I don't know about <laughs> All right, so.
Please help yourself. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, while he's heating that up, I did remember I have one little more true story. <clears throat> so apparently, in 1945, colonial America, Williamsburg, York, nails were so valuable, a law was passed that you could not burn a house down with nails. And that's actually a true law that was in place. There were a couple of reasons for that. One, if you were leaving Williamsburg, going out to the territories somewhere, you needed to take the nails with you, you unless you had a blacksmith with you with iron, nails to rebuild your house when you got there. And the colonial days, they also, when they first landed, they were in a very moist area, and they built wooden houses, and they would after a while, just from rotting, so they had to either remake nails or burn their own houses down, or uh, apparently somebody burnt their neighbor's house to get the nails. So I don't know if that law is still in effect, but don't burn your down for the nails. So. so anyway, that was all my stories. That's all right, it's not my hearty. Right. Yeah, that's what the good ones can do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Does that is that better for making the hids? If you miss, no, maybe just cut. Oh, for yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about just cutting it. Okay. Or I try not to. I'll get you some. Little air in the pipe. There we go.
of speaking of nail shops, Bruce has a Williamsburg style nail center that he made. I had a picture of it, but I didn't print it. So if you guys are interested, I don't know, that looks pretty good. We used to get from Baptist Pikes and Square, and then because we sell these to uh, uh, visitors who come around, you take little, little punch cards on each basket. Hey, Jesse. Would you lay those out in there with a the coat? Please. Well, the boss is there. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to make another one? Or? Oh, I'm good. Okay. Well, we have to make 50 before I came up with anything better. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, Forge Master, if you cut the forge off, please. dipped it. She said. That's pretty. Like I said, it's been 20 years. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I got it. I'm not. I'm not going to make that. <laughs> oh, that's my. Okay, can everybody give Kurt a hand for me, please? Yeah. Kurt, thank you very much, both of them. Okay, um, anyway, that kind of wraps it up. Any questions? Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> You're crazy, crazy, wouldn't it? <laughs>